Okay, welcome everyone to the evening session here at our center in Winnipeg. Buddhism is one of those things that are is quite can be quite daunting for newcomers. It's not a simple philosophy or teaching, and often efforts to summarize it in one or two words or sentences or paragraphs or even in a single book often. often uh, daunting, daunting task. So much so that there's a lot of misinformation out there and you have this um, phenomenon that's going around now of misquoting the Buddha. It's quite uh, common to find quotes attributed to the Buddha as though as though the Buddha gave such sound bites. And, and the curious thing is that it's very difficult to find quotes that are quotes of the Buddha that are quotable in this way. And so instead you've got all these fake Buddha quotes out there on the internet. So if you ever see a quote of the Buddha on the internet, unless it sounds difficult to understand, if it sounds easy to understand, it's probably fake. <laughs> it's an interesting thing because whenever we do quote the Buddha, people ask, what does that mean exactly? not easy to understand. If you read the Dhammapada, for example, which is thought to be one of the most quotable texts, even that, there the quotes require understanding and wisdom to, to, to make sense of. If a person isn't uh, engaged in the practice of the Buddha's teaching, it's still quite difficult to understand even these simple quotes. So, the, um, or the, at, at the very least, they're 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 not immediately recognizable as some philosophy until you put them into practice. And so this ha this has part partly to do with the fact that the Buddha's teaching is practical. It's something that you have to experience, and so it's ineffable or it's um, indescribable in some ways like the idea of Nibbāna as being something that you can't explain, you can't describe to someone else. It has to be experienced. As the Buddha said, the Dhamma is pachatang vedita bovinyu hi. Wise people will uh, know for themselves, know the truth, know the Dhamma for themselves. And yet, we still want to make this effort to somehow make the Buddha's teaching comprehensible. And we do, we, we have this need to always try to give a Reader's Digest summary, or at least an entry point. And we do have an entry point, probably the best entry point to the Buddha's teaching. It's actually not the Four Noble Truths, because these are still difficult for people to understand who haven't put them in, put into practice. And you can start there, but there's uh, an even better way, and this is going by the Buddha's final words. Could you imagine having taught for 45 years, having been, become quite a famous teacher, and knowing quite clearly that you're about to die, you're about to pass away? You'd be quite careful about what your last words were. And, well, at least the Buddha was quite careful about what his last words were and made quite sure to use them to their best effect, uh, to, to use the opportunity to make clear what his teaching was. And so he said, Vaya Dhamma Sankara Appamadena Sampadita. Why 
vaya dhamma sankara all formations are subject to cessation are subject to fading away appamadena sampadeta bring yourself to fulfillment or come to fulfillment through something called appamada so find perfection or, or, or find the ultimate or the goal of, uh, of the Buddhist teaching through something called Appamada. And up, so Appamada is really the core of the Buddhist teaching and the key to unlocking the truth that the Buddha found, the key to understanding reality, this concept of Appamada. And the com so much so that the commentary says uh, about this this term, he, it, it, or about this this the last words of the Buddha, it says, "Sakalampi hi te pitakang buddhavacchanang aharitva." When you take the whole of the Buddha's teaching, all the three pitakas, you see the Buddha's teaching is separated into three parts: the moral, the section on morality, the section on uh, concentration, and the section on wisdom. When you uh, bring it down and, and, and summarize it. Katiyamanang appamada padami va utarati. It boils down to, or it can be condensed down to, the path of uh, appamada. The path of being appamada. So the commentary is quite confident that this is really the essence of Buddhism, this one concept. And so it's a, it's a very good place to start. Uh, the word apamada is, is actually quite a simple word and, and, and ostensibly doesn't seem all that uh, in, all that essential or it doesn't, doesn't seem to say much more than uh, simply being a heedful. Pamada means uh, negligent or, or intoxicated or uh, sort of uh, perhaps uh, lazy or, or it's, it's, the, it's the word pamada is a word you use to describe someone who is drunk so appamada is someone who is sober or someone who is clear minded or someone who is alert it has the, the concept of the, the idea of being alert and being uh, having some uh, sense of vigilance not being uh, negligent but this this one term it, it picks up the essence of what we often refer to as mindfulness and really the Buddha the practice of the Buddha's teaching is quite a simple concept is quite a simple uh, uh, technique or, or uh, practice it's simply to be present to be alert to have this appamada this sense of not getting caught up or not getting carried away by uh, the phenomena that present themselves. This is really it. It's really a simple thing. You see, when, when you experience uh, seeing or hearing, or when you have a feeling in the body, ordinarily we, we react to it. We like it or we dislike it. We cling to it. When we have a thought come up in the mind, we follow it. When we have uh, a, a, an image or an idea arise in the mind, we, we, we crave for it. So sitting here listening to the talk, you will find that your mind wa is wandering, going home, going to, to work, going to school, going to your room, thinking about uh, games and work and, and, and things that you have to do or things that you'd rather be doing things that you want to do it might go back to the past and all of this is what the Buddha called Bhamada this is being uh, heedless or negligent getting um, lost so we were talk, talking about yesterday the idea of, um, of being uprooted from reality this is what this means. Your mind becomes 
disconnected from what's really going on. Right? When, when you think, it's only a thought. When you have an idea, it's only an idea. When you have a feeling in the body, it's only a feeling. This is, this is objective truth. That's really all it is. When you see something, it's only seeing. There's, there's nothing in the experience that says it's good or it's bad. And as difficult as it is to understand, this goes for things like pain, it goes for unpleasantness, it goes for any kind of experience that we think brings us suffering. And so it really is a type of negligence to be, to get caught up in these experiences and to uh, get lost in them, to see more and more in them than is actually there. So this is the idea of what we mean by apamada, the um, the actual practice of being apamada is what we focus all, all of our attention on and the Buddha did give clear instructions on how to be apamada and this is where, uh, where we begin to enter into the Buddha's teaching. So what do we mean by the Buddha's teaching or, or how, do, how is it that we practice uh, the Buddha's teaching of apamada? The, well the Buddha, uh, in, in brief, the first thing we can understand about Pamada is the Buddha actually did equate it to mindfulness. So when we hear the when we hear this idea of being alert, of being non of not being negligent, of being vigilant and heedful, it actually does mean being mindful all the time. The Buddha said, Satya Avipavasa Apamado Tivuchati. Avipavaso Satya Avipavaso Apamado Tivuchati. Someone who is never without mindfulness is someone who is vigilant. So this is the basic concept of mindfulness. What do we mean by mindfulness? It means being... Or what do we mean by vigilance? It means being mindful at all times. So if for every experience we can be clearly aware of it as it is, as it occurs, this is uh, to be vigilant. And it's... Uh, It's um, it's it's important to understand that this is a quite a specific concept, a specific definition of what we mean by of what can be meant by vigilance. So some people might think vigilance is as somehow forcing your mind not to think certain things or uh, forcing your mind into certain. To, to, to stick with certain uh, states. You know. So often a, medita a meditator will um, force their mind to be focused or force their mind not to think or force themselves not to get angry or so on and so on. But by vigilance we really are referring to this, this idea of being a, a, a watchman. And the Buddha would often talk about a, a person who was guarding a door, watching everyone come through and making sure that that everything stayed orderly, stayed in order, uh, maintaining the peace. So vigilance doesn't mean uh, refusing entry to any 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 phenomenon. It means uh, guarding the phenomenon, guarding the guarding the door or guarding the doors, uh, and maintaining order. When you do see, let it just be seeing. When you do hear, let it just be hearing. And so this is. This is um, this is why we have this strange practice of repeating the phenomena as we experience them. So it seems for, counterintuitive for a meditator to have to reiterate or reify the experience when you see something. Well, I already see it. Why should I have to uh, say to myself, "Seeing, seeing"? Or when you hear something, why should I have to say to myself, "Hearing, hearing"? Uh, and this is this this is in order. This is because we're trying to create this uh, watchfulness or this vigilance. 
so that the mind stays stays at that um, uh, objective awareness. Because as soon as you see something, it's it's uh, initially objective. When you hear something, the, the first moment is an objective hearing, but if you let your mind go, if you're not vigilant, there will arise immediately liking and disliking, judging, identifying, and so on. So when someone says something nasty to you, you get angry at it. When someone says something nice to you, you're pleased by it. Or when you hear a nice sound, you're attracted to it. Or you see a nice sight, you're attracted to it, and so on. Because of letting the mind go. Because of not being, not being vigilant in terms of staying with what's really there. It's because the mind is inclined to all sorts of you know, wrong ideas. Our, the, 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 the ordinary state of the mind that we're born with is already crooked. It's already on the wrong track. It has lots and lots of wrong ideas. Certainly what we come to meditation with is full of all sorts of wrong ideas about reality that we've acquired over the years just through uh, bumbling through life uh, ignorantly. You know, the, the, the ways we deal with stress, the ways we deal with suffering, the days, ways we deal with conflict, they're all uh, imperfect to say the least. Most of them are, are highly damaging to us and, and habit-forming, addictive, and uh, a cause for a great amount of stress and suffering. So if we can, so the the practice is to untie all of that, and we're actually undertaking something, uh, a practice to change essentially our our very nature. So, in brief, this is simply being mindful, simply this uh, satya, sati, to ha to have the recognition of things. When seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing, everything that you experience is just what it is. So when, uh, even just sitting here now, all of the experiences that we have of seeing, of hearing, the pain that we have in the body is just pain. When you can remind yourself, when you can keep your mind objective about it. This, um, there's this one idea of what it is that gives rise to sati, and that is um, what we call tira sanya, which means this reaffirming or firm or solid uh, perception. Meaning, when you perceive something, you, you see it as seeing, you know, that's perception. When you hear something, you know it's hearing, that's perception. This tirasanya is, is the, the fixing on that perception, which is precisely what we're talking about here, this concept of uh, reifying or, or reiterating or reminding yourself. The word sati, uh, a, transla a, a simple translation is remembrance or, or recollection, to remind yourself or to recall what it is that's really going on. So when you have pain and you can just say to yourself, pain, pain, pain. This is the um, rem reminding yourself and the remembrance that keeps you clearly aware of the object as it occurs. But beyond that, the Buddha gave us more to go on. He talked about uh, appamada as being made up of four parts. So uh, expanding upon this idea of being mindful, what it means in detail is four things. And so the Buddha said, Akodhano, uh, Akodhano Sada Sato, Ajatang Susamahito, Abhijja Vinaye Sikang Appamado Pujati. This is what we mean by Appamada, four things. Akodhano means not being angry, never getting angry at anything, having patience to deal with whatever comes to you. Sada Sato is this always being mindful. This one we've already talked about. Susama, ajatang Susamahito means to be internally composed, to be calm in the mind, to, have your, to be level-headed and equanimous. Abhijja Vinaye Sikang, training yourself uh, to overcome, training yourself in overcoming addiction. Appamado diwuchati. This is what is meant by appamada. I meant by uh, vigilance. So this is all I want to say today. I'll go through these four, and then we can do some meditation together.
But this is, a, this is really the basis of our practice. If we wanted to go into, into more detail, well, I'll go into detail about these four and, and I'll go through it there, but um, the only final thing we have to talk about is the four Satipatthana, but we have them in here, so I'll just go through them. Akodano, uh, and you, you see we have two on, on the, we have these two, two sides of it. Akodano means to not get angry, and Abhijavane Sikang means to overcome desires or liking or, or attachment or, or addiction, and they're separated. Akodano, the, the assumption is that you can very easily overcome anger, and this is true because anger is something that changes quickly. According to the Buddha's teaching, um, greed is something that is overcome slowly. It's something that disappears slowly because it's more habit-forming because it's, a, it's agreeable, because the mind inclines towards it. But the mind doesn't incline towards anger. Uh, anger is something that is quite quick to to change. No one wants to be angry. And so it's relatively easy to to uh, to discard when it arises. And so, but without any teaching on it, the, the, the reason why anger persists is because people, uh, no, no, we're, we're not clearly aware that anger is causing us suffering. We think that it's our surroundings or the, our experiences that cause us suffering. Um, we think that it's the pain that's causing us suffering. We think that it's the uh, loud noise or it's having to bear with um, difficult situations, boredom. We, we think it's the situation that is boring, you know, uninteresting, difficult to bear. When in fact this isn't the case, the, 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 the actual cause of our suffering is our own minds, it's our anger. Our, and, and by anger we mean all sorts of negative mind states, boredom, frustration, disliking, sadness, fear, all of these are under the, the heading of what we call anger or, or aversion based mind states. All of these we have, all of these are the cause of suffering. When we understand this, when we have this teaching, um, this reminder, of what is actually causing us suffering, it, it, it becomes quite easy to live without suffering when we give up this, this disliking. So the Buddha said, Akodano, never get angry, never cultivate this, never think that there's some benefit to be had from getting upset and getting frustrated and so on. Uh, number two, Sada Sato, as I talked about, being always mindful. It really does mean being mindful all the time. This means in everything you do, being mindful when you're eating, to be mindful of the chewing and the swallowing. When you're um, when you're showering, being mindful of the water and the, the scrubbing and so on. The Buddha even said, when you're on the toilet, being mindful. Uh, whatever you do during the day, being mindful of it all the time. When you're walking, being mindful of every step, walking, walking, or if you do the walking meditation. Stepping right, or lifting, placing, or lifting, moving, placing, and so on. Be mindful of it from every moment. It's something that you can do right here and now. It's something that we should be doing uh, all the time. So, sada sato, it doesn't mean doing an hour of meditation and putting it aside. It means trying to be mindful in everything you do. Catching yourself when you get angry. Catching yourself when you have, have desire, or when you want something when you have worry or when you have stress or when you have doubt or confusion, catching yourself at every moment. Sada sato. And so, g given that how, how, what an important place sati, places, sati has in the meditation, the Buddha actually broke it up into four parts, and many of you are aware of the four satipatthana. This is another way of understanding the key to the, or the, the, the essence of the Buddha's teaching, because it really is the essence of being vigilant. Being vigilant means to be mindful, to be, be alert, to be clearly aware and to remind yourself and to keep yourself objective. And so we have a special practice of the four satipatthana as a means of cultivating uh, mindfulness or, or as a framework in which to cultivate mindfulness. So the four satipatthana are the body, kaya, vedana, the feelings, Chitta, the mind, and Dhamma, which are the um, the realities or the aspects of reality or the Buddhist teaching. 
that uh, the, the Buddha separated them into these four to give very practical, a very practical framework in which we could cultivate mindfulness. This is just somewhat arbitrary, but, but in arbitrary in the sense of you won't find the Satipatthana out in nature. You won't be able to go and look and see, oh, there's the one to... You have instead, a, a, here's a practical framework that the Buddha gave. He said, start with the body. So, kaya, when we watch the stomach rising and falling, or when we know that we're sitting, or when we know that we're walking, or we know bending, stretching, turning, reaching, grasping, lifting, chewing, swallowing, brushing your teeth, brushing, brushing. And knowing all of these things, this is the body. Feelings when we feel pain or aching, to, to remind ourselves pain, pain, or aching, aching. When we feel happy, to say to ourselves happy, happy. When we feel calm, 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 calm. This is mindfulness of the feelings. When we have thoughts, thinking, thinking, mindfulness of the mind. Or when we have emotions, liking, disliking, or when we feel drowsy or distracted, worried, or when we have doubt or confusion, to remind ourselves and be objective about them. This is this, this is liking, this is disliking. So we say to ourselves, liking, liking, disliking, disliking, and so on. This is mindfulness of the Dhamma. We, the Buddha gave this this framework in order to point out how important uh, mindfulness is or to, to give a uh, concrete practical framework in which to cultivate uh, his teaching. So the four Satipatthana really are the essence and this is the essence of vigilance and we have the Buddha's last words that, that, um, that reaffirm this. Vigilance and therefore mindfulness or uh, remembrance is really at the core of the Buddha's teaching, not trying to force things, not trying to become something or create something. It's one of the worst things that, that happen in, in meditation is the meditator will create something, a formation, will cultivate some sort of state and try to um, sustain it or maintain it, keep it, make it permanent, instead of being flexible and just seeing things as they are, just remembering things, remembering things for themselves um, as they are as, the, as they are in an essential form. So the, this is an, an important concept to understand. Number two. Number three, Ajatang Susamahito is, is a description of the state of mind when you're really meditating. It's uh, Ajatang means internally. You're internally composed. It means what's going on inside. So when we look around the world, room, we see everyone looks somewhat composed. If, if I sit here and close my eyes uh, externally, I'm quite composed. So what the Buddha is saying here is internally composed. It doesn't matter your form outside, it matters what's going on inside. How is your mind? Are you judgmental, partial? Uh, are you confused? Are you um, upset, stressed, worried? And you have the, this mental turmoil inside. This is what we're trying to. This is what we're we're trying to change. So, uh, an in, being internally composed means being sharp and alert, and flexible. It doesn't mean being fixed. It doesn't mean you have to focus and ignore everything around you. It means to be uh, equanimous. That whatever comes, there is. It do, it doesn't uh, disturb you. So, if someone insult a a good um, a good good indicator of a of a advanced meditator is that when when other when people instigate them and, and attack them and so on they don't get upset about it they're able to experience their emotions and let them go or even not give rise to the emotions that other people would to just be aware of things as they are and to roll and go with the flow and give their opinions when they're required but not be upset when people yell at them or when or taunt them or, or attack them or so on. Or when um, desirable things arise that they're not they're not um, upset by the the desire and the need. It doesn't become a need for it or, or or a discomfort in not having the things that you want. Being internally composed, this is a quality of mindfulness. It's this unshakable state. 
It's the wonder of mindfulness is that it, it is truly invincible. This simple technique, many people are actually criti critical of this technique and it's, it's um, sometimes uh, kind, of, kind of a shame because it really is invinci an Im imperturbable or, or uh, undeniable I don't remember what the word I'm looking for is uh, totally incontrovertible teaching. There, there, there's no um, there's no situation where you couldn't apply it, which is the way mindfulness should be. The Buddha said, "Satincha kuhang bikave sabatikam vadami." Mindfulness is ever useful, monks. There's no no situation where mindfulness wouldn't be useful, and this is very clear in this practice when. When you say to yourself, seeing or hearing, or when you really are clear in it, there's nothing that can bother you. I remember coming out of my first meditation course and we're sitting in the ca this cafe and suddenly there was a huge crash and all these dishes, someone had dropped a whole platter full of dishes and everyone in the cafe went, Phew! and and oh, and, 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 and shock. And me and the, guys, the other guy who was in the meditation course with me, we just sat there and hearing, and then we looked up at each other and we're like, oh, it, it really works. We, we, we could see that we, we had cultivated this ability to just experience it without reacting. This is the result you get from the practice. Of course, it's a silly result, but uh, example, but as a, uh, uh, in, as a general rule, you, you, you have this ability to just see things as they are. When people yell at you, when there's conflict, when there's something you want, you know, the ability to let it go. All of this is, um, it makes you invincible. No one has any pull on you. There's nothing that could happen to you that could destroy you. This is, uh, the Buddha said, came, uh, you become this, puttasa loka dhammehi jittang yasana kampati. When you're touched by the vicissitudes of the world, the mind that is unshaken, a soul kang, never sad or never disappointed, virajang, untainted, ke mang, safe. Itamangalamuttamang, this is one of life's highest blessings. So that's number three. And number four, abhijja uh, vinayesi kang. So unlike anger, the Buddha taught that, or he points out here, kind of just slips it in giving you the distinction between greed and anger. As I said, greed is something, in, greed and wanting and desire, addiction, attachment, all of these things are more sticky and more difficult to just dismiss. They are pleasant, and so they seem to um, be somehow beneficial, satisfying, uh, positive qualities, positive states of mind. And so the Buddha likened them to sweet poison. Some poison is very, very sweet. This is how if you want to kill ants, when we were young, this horrible karma of killing ants, and you just put out this sweet ant poison, and they come and they eat the poison, and they take it back and they share it with all their friends, and they destroy a whole family of ants, because it's sweet. This is... Um, this is what sensual desire is like, or sensual pleasures are like. This pleasure that we get from seeing, from hearing, from smelling, from tasting, from feeling, from thinking. We create a whole world, and if you look at our world, it's, it's so mired in sense pleasures, as the Buddha said. We're, we're stuck in the mud, so to speak. Yeah, so mired in the and, and without any clear path out, because we're, we're, we're so... Uh, strongly addicted to these things, that we've come to think of them as natural, as innate, as uh, a part of life, you know, or a essential uh, aspect of, of a good life, you know, sensual pleasure, so sexual pleasure, um, food, ple pleasure from eating, um, the comforts like soft beds and and seats, uh, music, uh, art, all of these things we think are, are essential 
for a, a, a happy life. It's gotten to the point where we think of these things, uh, we, we have the views, we have very strong views as to the benefit of these things. And so it's something that is, has to be overcome in, in layers. It's not something that you can just do away with or decide, no, I'm not going to want anything. Because even coming to that idea of not wanting to want anything, it, it, we're, we're very far away even from that because we have all these views. So even just the insinuation that art or music might be bad, somehow bad for you or somehow addictive and therefore a cause for suffering is uh, hugely unwelcome to us. So sexual pleasure is something that is innate and uh, people say it's part of being human. Uh, roman romance, this is something that is incredibly addictive. Um, and 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 therefore has has been ingrained in us as something that is good, and you just very difficult to see it otherwise, especially because it's sweet, because it's pleasurable. Every time you look at it, you say, "But it's pleasurable," and you don't. And uh, intellectually, many of them we can grasp as being problematic because you can see how they create. You can actually watch if you if you meditate, you can see how they're muddling your mind, they're confusing your mind. They're, they're degrading your uh, clarity of mind and your ability to be impartial. And a person who is, who is addicted to sensual pleasures makes a terrible judge uh, and be it becomes incredibly reactionary. They react to everything. They react to the slightest discomfort and get angry easily, are angered and frustrated easily, are uh, set in their ways. That's the kind of people who are unable to go out of their way to help someone else. They tend to be stingy and, and um, yeah, self-centered, self-serving and so on. This is what these things do to us. So intellectually we can see it, but um, practically speaking it's very they're very difficult to overcome. So the way we approach this is piece by piece. Obviously there are some addictions that we uh, would do better without and through basic meditation practice we can see these and we can see how oh, well, even some of the things that we thought were beneficial we come to see that they're actually causing us suffering. So we can see this clearer and clearer and so it therefore goes in layers. It's the Buddha thought this is a gradual practice, a gradual progress and something that has to be uh, accomplished in stages. And uh, this is really the essence of the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha in several occasions he said the basis of the practice is to see that nothing is worth clinging to. Sabe dhamma na lang saya. And of course, what is the he taught it as the cause of suffering, and this gets into the concept of the four noble truths that craving is the cause of suffering. It's this tanha, thirst it is that causes that is the essence, the essential cause of suffering. If we were able to let go and just be let things be as they are without wanting them to be otherwise, without chasing after uh, a specific set of experiences, and we would be free from suffering. But I'll leave that for another day. So I th thought this would be useful kind of as a meditation guide for us, some basic instruction on how to be uh, vigilant. There's more I can talk about how the Buddha taught the Buddha gave five ways to cultivate uh, vigilance, apamada, but I won't go into it. I think it's too much. And rather than do too much talking, I thought we'd do some meditation again together. So now we'll do a half an hour of meditation, and, uh, and we can, then we'll finish up with the chanting. So thank you.